Hi, this is Graphically Alex coming at you with all things fat related. If that's something that interests you, please subscribe. I'd love to have you. So for today, what I want to do is actually take it back. We're going to go back. We're going to go back to, I believe it's either 2013 or 2014, something like that. In that range, this video, it said it was 10 years ago. And we're going to go to Virgie Tovar's channel. So we're going back to the roots of fat acceptance, at least in the, the modern era, the very modern era. And I want to see just what was said 10 years ago, just for my own research, really. And also, I wanted you guys to come along. So we're going to watch Virgie Tovar, Virgie Tovar. She's kind of infamous for her cake video, which I may talk about at some point. But I'm going to call this series Retro F.A., so where we look at old things in regards to fat acceptance. So I haven't watched this. All I know is that it's about internalized fat phobia, which is definitely something I'm sure I'll have something to say to. So let's go ahead and get started. She's a little cheesy in the beginning. I've only seen the beginning. We're just going to react to the whole thing. So let's see what we got. Hey girl. Also just want to say, love the close-up, Virgie. It's a very interesting choice, for sure. <laughs> Not to say that we were all like experts at the internet 10 years ago, but it's very weird. Hey, this is Virgie Tovar's Guide to Fat Girl Living, and this episode, as promised, is about internalized fat phobia, and I need to get a little bit of credit because it is September 19th, and I did write it in my calendar on my website that I would upload a new video, and I stuck with it. So announcement number one, I have a calendar, I stuck with it. And I'm pretty proud of myself. Announcement number two is that if you go to my website, virgitovar.com, you will see that there is currently underway a amazing campaign or an amazing campaign called 50 Days of Fat Ferociousness. And every day um, I celebrate a... Okay, so we can see that the cringe has been around for quite a while. I'm trying to think of how, where I was 10 years ago. Um, let me just verify I want to make sure I get the date right. I really should have just looked, but as you guys know, I don't know. I'm a very big picture person, so let me see. Okay, 2012, September 19th. So this is over 10 years ago. Now, over 10 years ago, I was just barely starting to try to lose weight. And I do wonder how I would have heard this message. I probably would have thought she was cringe. I probably would have been like, ew, I don't want to hear this. This is weird. To be honest, I probably would have been scarred. Um, if anything, I was more judgmental when I was younger, not less, <laughs> which is an interesting thing. Um, so let's go ahead and see <laughs> what else she says. It's interesting to take me back to that time. I also could barely speak on camera. I hated the sound of my voice. I hated everything, but I had this weird drive to be online. So I actually did first start trying 10 years ago. Interesting. Interesting. We see somebody went much further than me. Fatty or a piece of fat history or some literature or a quote or all of this related to fat life in anticipation of the release of dun dun dun, dun hot and heavy fierce fat girls on life love and fashion which is coming out in about a month a little bit more than a month all right so that was the big yeah so I guess a lot of the cringe just has not changed announcement um let's get started with internalized fat phobia okay so i took some notes actually and i'm going to give you the run through on the outline just to run through it dry the concept of internalized fat phobia it's cringy i can kind of understand the point i do think there is a case to be made that a lot of fat people don't like other fat people it's not all, obviously, but it is definitely a thing. I've noticed it within, as you guys know, I'm back on the apps. I'm trying. Hashtag, this is me trying. Taylor Swift moment. 
But seriously, I am trying. And I myself, I don't really have an issue with other fat guys. But I find that a lot of fat guys have an issue with me being fat. And so I do think there is somewhat of an element of this, but I mean, dating preferences are fair for anybody, right? I'm not entitled to anybody's attraction. I'm not that kind of person. Like you're into it or you're not. It's just an observation. It's something I've noticed, at least within my specific sector of the dating world. But let's see what she has to say. So we're going to cover... What is internalized fat phobia? How do you acquire it? What are the symptoms? Can I unlearn internalized fat phobia and how? So we've got five points and I will cover all of them. All right, so first of all, what is internalized fat phobia? I actually just wrote a little essay um, kind of related to gender and fatness, um, but talks a little bit about this idea of internalized fat phobia. And I wanted to, I want to read it to you really quickly. It's a paragraph. So I know I don't normally read, but. Girl, like what is, oh my gosh, why is she that close? Like I'm trying to remember the time frame. Like I think I was watching like Shane Dawson back then and he would do stuff like that too. I just wonder if that was a trend or something. But I think he would do it for comedy. But I'm just like, girl, like, this is weird. Like, I I don't know. I'm trying to, like, keep the time in mind and not judge it by, like, today's standard. But it's like, oh, my gosh. Jeez. Work with me. Okay. In critical race theory, we use the word occupy. to Critical race theory. Interesting. Explain the idea of internalization. I was not expecting to hear that. <laughs> so that's interesting. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So she's definitely making a connection. I between. She said critical race theory, right? Me. Okay. In critical race theory. Yeah. So she's making the connection between. Fatness and critical race theory. And she's okay. Okay. So I guess maybe this is why a lot of times they talk about race because apparently in its little inception, fat acceptance TikTok connected and probably utilized the same methods, same ideology, same everything as critical race theory. Very interesting. Very interesting. We use the word occupy to explain the idea of internalization when a cultural idea or thought becomes part of a personal value system that then changes the way that you see. So basically it's like when a when a socially constructed idea or a cultural norm um, becomes part of our worldview and it changes the way we see the world. To a critic, the thing that always interests me about people that make these arguments is that they view culture as some kind of weird vacuum. Like Virgie Tovar acts as if she has no impact on culture or really anything like that, right? It's always like, where are the different ones? Where are the where are the rads? You know, where are the radicals? We're doing something totally new and different and blah blah blah. But there's a lot of these types of F.A. things going on today in many, many aspects of culture. So couldn't you say that your idea of fatness was also put upon you by culture, by whoever taught you that this was a thing? That's where it always loses me is what is taught. Like you cannot generalize everybody's experience as one experience it's just not real so one person is taught to be fat as bad and another person in childhood by their parents or community or state or whatever or country or wherever you can take it as broad as possible or as you know narrow as possible people are going to have differences of opinion so in the 2000s, for example, the United States was weirdly polarized with a lot of 
celebrities and people like that being expected to be extremely thin. But it was especially, I don't know how else to say this, but it was especially like white women were supposed to be super thin. Other cultures within the U.S., they didn't have that expectation. I've heard this a lot from like Michelle McDaniel. I watch another channel called um, Vegan Deterioration. <laughs> and she's she's she talks about her experience growing up and she's black as well. And I've seen, you know, I have a lot of friends that are Hispanic. You know, I myself am half Hispanic. Um, and there was a lot of differences in culture, differences in general in the 2000s where you would have this idea that being fat is bad but telling somebody that they're fat is also bad but also if you're in the family you can tell them that they're fat but also maybe if you're not white then it doesn't matter if you're fat it was a weird time um it was weird (laughs) Like, I remember Raven Simone kind of gaining weight and people would talk about it, but I don't know. It was a weird time. (laughs) It was weird. I remember Oprah would always talk about it too. So I don't know. It really depends on where you were at. So I do wonder, where was Virgie? What was she taught? What is culture to her? You cannot make that broad of a statement because everybody's culture may be slightly different or the experience of the culture may be different. That's all I'm saying. I very much was raised in an environment where being fat was bad. So we'll leave it at that. Fat woman, um, one might say, or, or the critic might say, you are unable to see the beauty of a fat body because your mind is occupied by images and values that have taught you a fat body is not beautiful or good. Before occupation, a fat body is a body that is big. Even the word fat has been imbued with cultural meaning, charged, politicized. Yes, fat is biological, but it is also supremely cultural, as Don Kulik and Anne Menely say. And- so we can see a lot of these ideas of you know the personal, political, and blah, 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 which has led to a lot of horrible things that are going on now. Um, that definitely hit a peak in 2020 where everything was political in 2020. Every single moment of everybody's life was political, it seemed like. Um, Maybe not every single person, but that's what it felt like then. Being fat is not political. Losing weight is not political. There never has been anything, like it is not political to be fat or thin like that is something that these people made up you push this idea you combined it with critical race theory which is definitely political so you tried to have fatness within critical race theory and created a political stance about fatness that didn't really exist it was really just well that's the way they look or i'm big boned or it's not healthy or whatever that was really the conversation back then or oh she doesn't look good she's fat it's that kind of thing it it wasn't political it had nothing to do with voting laws any of that stuff at the time i remember these people they depend on gen z not remembering what things were like <laughs> in the 2000s but i do sorry virgie that the anthropology of an obsession god i quote them so often um after occupation a big body transforms into a fat one and thereby becomes a container for the culture's opinions a fat woman's body is a site of great moral pontification and profound gendered expectation a fat woman's body holds many secrets (laughs) we're quoting titanic now i'm just kidding um Okay, that's really cheesy. Really, really cheesy. I, oh man, I just, yeah, I definitely would have thought this was really cringy. 
even 10 years ago, I would have just, she would have just blown me out of the room with that. Um, that was kind of a, a really flourishy way of explaining what internalization is. Um, so internalized fat phobia is um, basically taking the cultural idea that fat is bad and that it's a morally bad issue and that it's unhealthy and internalizing it into your mind such that it becomes part of the way that you think and the way that you output thoughts. Um, See, what they don't understand as well is if I were to try to act as if being fat was not unhealthy, I would have to block out the physical sensations of my body. I would have to really just pretend and walk around in a daily delusion. When you are of a certain size, you feel the effects of being fat every single moment of every single day. So it is laughable to act as if this is a cultural or societal thing, but it is interesting that remember, we're looking at the roots of this movement in the modern era. So it is very interesting this was being talked about this way over 10 years ago. That's, that's in a nutshell what internalized fat phobia is. Okay, on to point number two. Um, point number two is how do you acquire it? Basically, um, through a lifelong process of rewards and punishment. So we start learning really, really, really young what our culture expects from us. And the way that this happens is, um, you know, our parents, um, kids at school, our teachers, other adults around us, the television tells us what our culture thinks is good and normal and bad and wrong. Um, so it's interesting to me, too, is I feel like a lot of fat acceptance people, so people that take this issue and run with it, they have a sort of need for attention. I know that, that sounds harsh, but they always describe things in this way. I remember growing up, I've, I've always told you guys, and I will continue to say, I'm very disagreeable as a person. I may be one of the most feminine gay men you would ever know in your whole life. But I have a hella masculine trait in that I am very disagreeable. I'm very high on disagreeableness. It's kind of tough, <laughs> I will say, because people don't expect you to be this disagreeable when you're as feminine as I am. But it is just, a, I mean, I am still a man at the end of the day, and th that is a masculine part of my brain that is very much very strong. And so when I hear this, oh, you know, culture taught you this and that and blah, 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 da, 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 it's like, you know, you know, Virgie, I've been disagreeing with everybody from the time I was born. I, I just feel like I get it, but also like I don't know if it affected everybody as much as it affected you. I don't think these people realize that different people care about punishment, reward, societal expectation, blah, 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 all this stuff. Not everybody cares about it as much as you, Virgie. I don't think that she gets that. A lot of people don't care what people think. I don't think that she gets that. And uh, what? so I kind of, like I, the analogy I often do, the metaphor I give when I'm teaching classes, for example, is if you think of like a, a vase, like a vase for flowers, right? Like, and it starts out with nothing in it. It's an empty vase. And then you start putting things inside of it, you know, and it gets filled up. Um, and maybe a vase isn't a great metaphor. But anyway, you got what I'm saying. It's like a good... Okay, so they believe in that sort of blank slate concept of humanity that's interesting i don't i think there are a lot of things that are innate um for example i do believe that i was born gay i know i know i know it's a hugely controversial take but i do believe that i do believe people are born straight as well and bi <laughs> i know i know it's crazy it's really really wild um, but I don't believe in blank slate because of that. You know, I also believe we are born with hair color, eye color, certain personality traits, like probably introversion and extroversion. I believe those are, you know, I think there are a lot of things that are more inborn or genetic and there are definitely interactions with the environment. And I do think as a part of that 
genetic variability, there are certain people that are very agreeable or that do really depend on affirmations of other people. So I do think that's probably just that her and people like her, they tend to really live and die by what other people think. And not everybody does. And they, but they're, again, this is where the hypohase comes in. The solipsisticness that I talk about of people with hypo, severe hypo, she cannot acknowledge that other people may have had a different experience, that other people may not have cared as much about what other people thought. She can't acknowledge that because if she did, then her worldview would kind of fall apart. Why? Because if certain people like myself were not as influenced by culture and still came to the conclusion that being fat is unhealthy and or unattractive, which there were times in my life when I did find it unattractive and times in my life where I didn't care. I do think certain things with an attraction can change in a person, but I don't believe sexuality can, but shh, I don't want to trigger anybody, <laughs> but I don't. But the point is, um, when it comes to these kinds of things, we cannot say one way or the other, you know? We can't truly feel that we know another person's experience completely or that we know all of society because we know what every single person feels and thinks and was taught. It's just not real. That's We're seeing my disagreements with that acceptance very plain as day. Um, which is kind of like our minds. Like, yes, we're born with some you know, instincts as humans, but for the most part, we have to learn what's normal and good and bad and wrong and what's inappropriate and what's okay. Like, so one, another big example I give people is like, remember when you were a little kid and you ate your own boogers? I was not a booger eater, but I was a shoe licker. Um, I, not the outside of the shoe, but I really like the smell of leather. Anyway, another story altogether. But the point is, I used to go into the shoe store, and I loved the smell of leather, and I used to lick all the shoes, trying to get that, like, smell of leather into my mouth. It never worked out, um, it's, it's probably because I was at Payless, and nothing there is made of leather. Um, but the point is that, um, you know, I had to learn, like, my mom caught me, and I got in trouble, and she's like, that's dirty, you know, that's that's um you know it's like mogrosa or whatever like um and you know you know you don't do that so um likewise little kids do all kinds of things that are like we now think of as inappropriate so like you know lifting up your skirt and showing everybody your underwear and eating boogers and touching worms and um <laughs> all kinds of other things so we had to learn through a process of like getting caught being punished learning shame and whatnot um, that those activities were not acceptable in our culture now it's important to keep in mind that yes there are some cross-cultural consistent things like you know some like for example um, most cultures seem to have a really keen fascination and attraction with youth um, and that's fairly cross-cultural in terms of like sexual attraction but there are lots and lots of other things and like I think of beauty as fairly relative and we can kind of see it in the way that it manifests um, in other countries like for example in northern Thailand um, you, you've probably seen the women wear multiple rings on their necks because the length of the neck is a signifier of how beautiful the girl or the woman is and in Mauritania um, women are um, sort of fattened before marriage to the point of like discomfort and you know there's definitely questions about the human rights aspect of it um, but because fat women brown women are considered beautiful they're fattened and force fed before they get married um, so you know th these culture these cult sort of cultural ideals seem very unusual to us but they be they're very normal because these people grew up in this culture in the same way that we did so we're deeply immersed in it and it seems totally normal but like imagine if I you know if I told you that um, you know, uh, in, in the culture that I'm from, if you weren't from here, I was like, the, in the culture I'm from, um, women wear small stilts and they put potentially toxic material all over their face all the time. Would you think that was normal? No, but like we grew up in that culture um, and that's normal to us. So how do we acquire it through a lifetime of... It doesn't have to be though. You don't have to listen to every single thing. That's 
what's interesting. I, I think what's important is to have, this is why like I personally am religious because I have moral values that are not necessarily based in culture alone. And so even if I was in a different country or a different place or a different time, there would still be something rooting me morally beyond, you know, the culture. So it doesn't have to be a religion, but even if you have certain principles or different philosophies, something that's a bit higher, which to be fair, fat acceptance is a philosophy. Maybe some could argue it as a religion, depending. Some say cult. (laughs) Many of you guys in my comments say cult. Uh, But that definitely could fly in the face of cultural norms, and it definitely does within the United States. So, uh, and also in other countries to be, like if you were to be in Japan and subscribe to fat acceptance, it would be very unusual. (laughs) So, I mean... I don't think it's good personally to just be a tumbleweed blowing in the wind of culture, but you got to make sure you have a good philosophy, not something like fat acceptance, which is terrible. Rewards and punishments, lessons learned, um, a lot of them involving guilt when we do something that's considered wrong um, and rewards like, oh, you did such a great job. Look at you. Yay. Um Well, and fat acceptance is no different. They punish people for losing weight. They praise people for eating bad, (laughs) for eating and eating and eating and eating. They praise people for that or dancing around with their shirt off or doing weird things like that or praised. They're told that they're beautiful. They're told all this stuff. And it's a bit of an echo chamber. And again, if you're this kind of person where you are very agreeable or you really care about cultural norms or you care about being accepted or acceptable, You might want to make sure that you're appealing to society in general and not just a weird little corner of the internet because then you might be unhappy. Like I said, it's not my experience. I'm very disagreeable, so I don't get it. But that's just something I see from the outside looking in. Um, Or more subtle rewards, um, like having more access to partners or having more access to certain jobs, um, let's say. So as far as partners and jobs, the only thing that matters is if you want them. If you have access or don't, I personally don't want to be a model. I don't want to, I don't know what else I could have more access to by being thin, but I don't personally want to be a model, for example. So it doesn't matter. As far as a partner, I don't want to have relations with every single man in the entire world. I'm very selective. I'm picky. It doesn't matter for any one person if they can have anyone they want. What matters is if they can have who they want and if who they want wants them back. That's kind of how that works. (laughs) So I think it's ridiculous to care about that kind of thing. Even if you were thin, you would still have issues accessing a partner that you want. It would still happen. I know it shocks you, Virgie. I know. I have many thin friends that have had struggles from time to time. So that's how we acquire internalized fat phobia. Um, How do I know I have it? Well, some of you know you have it. Some of you don't know you have it. Some of you may think, I don't, what, but anyway, the point is that um, none of us can live in a cultural vacuum. So even if you're really, really, really on top of your stuff, like you're really good with your fat phobia critique. Yes, but is this a culture? They don't view what they're pushing as a culture. So can this possibly be rubbing off on you? No way. Okay. 
you've got all these fantastic intersectional analyses. Good for you. I can I encourage you to keep doing that. But um, keep in mind that uh, no no one can live outside of the culture that we're immersed in. So um, chances are that most of us have even a little bit of residual fat phobia because fat phobia is so rampant in our society. Um, so the symptoms of it um, might be uh, self-criticism. That's like probably the easiest one um, to, to sort of call to mind. So when you look in the mirror, do you constantly um, see imperfection that's related to being fat. Um, when you uh, think about your body, when you're fantasizing, do you think of a different self? Um, Couldn't these also be ED behaviors? Because when I was in my BED, I would have those issues. When I got better, I didn't have it anymore. Couldn't that be a mental illness? depending on how extreme it is anyway. When you're making love or whatever, like do you think about um, being in a different body or do you do you disidentify or disembody? Um, that's like on a self level, like a, a one, like an internal level, intrapersonal, internalized fat phobia. And then interpersonal fat phobia might be a little bit harder for you to admit that you're doing, um, but uh, if you're doing them. So like one example of, intra or interpersonal internalized fat phobia would be like you don't like to hang out with other fat people because it brings attention to you and you find yourself being really embarrassed and hyper aware of who's looking at you and what's going on. Um, another really um, interesting interpersonal one is um, only being attracted to thin-bodied people or preferring thin-bodied partners. Um, and I, this one's really hard. Oh, wow, this is weird. Oh gosh, it always bothers me when they talk about who people are attracted to. It's so, oh gosh, like I said, it's probably a product of um, of being gay. And again, I was raised in an evangelical church. So for me personally, when I hear people try to act like you can change what you're into or like you should unless if obviously it's something really heinous but when people act like that it it freaks me out a bit it's a little bit of a trigger it's like ugh, ugh, like you're encroaching on that very personal very private part of my life and i don't like it um also you're making it cringy like there's a lot of people that don't care about size. And when you talk about it in this way, people that maybe would have dated a fat person, they probably won't now. Like you're actually turning people off, <laughs> to be honest, because it's so off-putting and so cringy the way that you talk about this. I don't like that kind of thing. I will say 10 years ago, I did not think I was attractive at all. I don't know if it was just a product of being younger or if it was a product of being fat or if it was a hypo haze related thing, but I did not see myself as a sexual being for a long time. Like I was very cut off from my body. <clears throat> Probably part of it was being closeted as well. So it was very hard for me when a guy was interested in me. I was completely thrown off. I had no idea. All because people like this told me forever that nobody would ever find you attractive if you're fat. Uh, you really had both sides saying that a lot. So when it happened, I was shocked. It was shocking. I couldn't believe it. So I think a lot of times when you push this kind of stuff, like she's acting like she's fighting it, but they don't realize they actually reinforce these messages. And I think it is because a lot of this is a mental illness, in my opinion, and it, they're kind of trying to push it onto young people. That's my opinion. Like we've all been taught that thin bodies are beautiful and that but you're taught that by the media or by people like you. Because you reinforce each other. Um, and that's why I think you need to just leave people alone.
you know, I don't care, you guys. If you're attracted to a fat person, if you're not attracted to a fat person, it's not a big deal. Um, you know, they're as long as somebody is able to consent, they're of age, there's no dishonesty going on, you know, you're keeping hurt minimized as much as possible. Um, obviously for me, I believe in monogamy for myself at least, but I just think you have to be like just a decent person with this kind of stuff, you know, it doesn't matter if you're not attracted to a fat person or a thin person. It's like, it doesn't matter in my mind, at least it doesn't matter if you're not attracted to women or if you're not attracted to men, it's okay. Like there's no need to push this onto somebody. It's very creepy. Very creepy. A lot of ways I feel like um, fat girls are like patted on the back for having a thin partner because it somehow validates our attractiveness. And it Is that why you search for a thin partner, Bridgie? Validates our existence and it's really hard to... So I think a lot of these people, they say this stuff, but they actually really internalize these messages and they push it further. So the irony, in my opinion, of fat internalized fat phobia is often the people that preach out against it are probably the ones that have the most of it and it's very interesting very interesting um and i think too i don't know it's just very interesting how a lot of them choose thin partners that desire to um, to pass, you know, and it's all about passing, right? Like it's all about um, desiring to be read as normal, and it's completely natural to want to be normal. Um, okay, I never thought of it that way. I thought of it as I feel huge, I feel like I'm not attractive, I feel like I can't fit on this couch, I feel like you know. I'm always having to sit in this seat in the car. I'm always having to worry about if I'm going to break a chair or not. I I feel embarrassed. You know, I, I had very high anxiety and depression because I had such horrible hypo. And I, didn't ha I felt like I had no energy. I didn't understand how other people could get jobs or work. I struggled with working really, really badly. I struggled with holding down a job. So it's like, I didn't understand that. And then because I couldn't hold down a job, I had less money. Then I feel bad because I have less money. It's like, it's a whole thing. But it was never what she just described. It was never about being normal. I could say maybe it was about being normal in terms of my sexuality, but not in terms of being fat. That's... It just doesn't quite mesh. I don't know. It's just not the same. I mean, our culture has all kinds of things, all kinds of rewards for people who are deemed normal. Um, and I get it. Like, I have sympathy for you. Um, but, you know, th these are examples of the ways that internalized fat phobia manifests. Um, okay. Are you ready for how? Okay. So I talked about how. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, the next one was can I unlearn it? And the answer is yes. Can I unlearn? You can absolutely join our cult. No, but that's good. That means you can unlearn FA as well. So if you're trying to do that, welcome. <laughs> we love you. Phobia. Absolutely. Um, I think that it's definitely a lifetime worth of work. Um, I don't, I'm hesitant to say that we can unravel um, every single part of our internalized stuff because then what does it even matter? Why should you try? I always want to ask these people that when they say that. It's just weird. Very weird. We, for as long as we're in this culture, walking in it day to day, reading magazines, just going outside, you know, even, we are solidifying and concretizing the process, concretizing the internalized stuff. And, like, we walk around in a culture that's deeply immersed in, like, sizeism and homophobia and fat phobia and racism and ableism okay. and ageism. So they were already combining everything. Interesting.
and it's so thick like it's I, I sort of say I think of it as like the air that we breathe so can we stop breathing air no. Um, can we learn how to be critical about the things and messages around us? Can we learn to sift through our own, um, you know, messed up thinking? Like, absolutely. Um, and, you know, don't be don't be ashamed if that sounds really scary. I know, but how can you determine what is messed up and what isn't? I always get very confused with these kinds of people. So what is messed up versus what isn't? How would you define that? So how is it messed up? to not want to be fat? How is it messed up to think I should lose weight to get healthier? What defines that as messed up? And how is that similar to something like racism, homophobia, sexism? How is it similar to think, oh, I should lose weight because I can't fit in my car? I need you to give me a way that that connects. I need that. And I never get it. Because it's really, it's a lot of work. Um, but it's so worth it. Okay, number five. That brings us to the final point. How? How do you unlearn um, internalized fat phobia? All right, so I wrote this down. Okay, uh, in terms of attraction, um, date somebody who you normally don't date. Ew. This is giving very, I'm straight, but I'm going to try to do something with you as an experiment. No. What the hell, Virgie? You are so weird. Gross. Um, you know, find, find the hotness in somebody. You might not necessarily instantly think like, oh, yeah, that, that person reads hot to me in my head. Because basically, um, again that is biological. I wonder what it is with these people. I I do wonder, like, for those of you that do believe this, that attraction is purely cultural, please explain it to me down below, because I can assure you I was very much discouraged from being gay, and I'm not. I'm not straight. I was encouraged on every single level to not be attracted to men, and I was. So do tell how culture changes that. It's a bit ridiculous, in my opinion. It's just really crazy. I think if I think it's worth looking at if you are determining who you're attracted to by cultural standards alone and not your own. You're attracted by your physical body. Like your physical body is attracted to another person. I think it's important to have your body involved in the process of mate selection. I think maybe a lot of people don't do that. And that's why a lot of relationships fail. Just a thought. Just a thought. But gosh, that is weird. That is creepy. I would never want somebody who wasn't attracted to me to try to date me. Do not try to date me if you're not attracted to me. That is creepy and weird and disgusting. And like through films and billboards and magazines and whatnot, we have been trained to think what is hot. Like, so we've been taught to know, to recognize. Okay, does she not have any sex drive at all? Very weird. It's very strange how they completely ignore biology. Very strange. I'm guessing there's some hormonal issues there, Virgie. And your drive is probably very low. So that's why you think of it in all these weird ways. That's my thoughts what is hot and we can change that basically like our brain is hugely malleable um like we can change all kinds of things in it we can literally we can change if we're gay or straight you can change absolutely oh my gosh wow and here what i was thinking virgie is far left i guess she's far right actually
and like the neuroanatomy of our minds. Ooh. Anyway, Ooh. okay. So Ooh, um, because she says neuroanatomy, she's not saying something that she would totally argue against in a different context. You're nuts. Another one in terms of like intrapersonal related to sexuality and romance also, um, I often recommend that women watch porn that has fat women. If you watch porn, um, you know, just watch, throw in the mix like some fat girls if you don't have any fatties in your porn um, or like whatever you know, gender, um, you can, you can. Why is she telling people this? I mean, is this just, am I just being extra? Like, I don't know. I am horrified that she's talking about, like that she's doing this. That is so disgusting to me to try to suggest to somebody what to watch. That is crazy. Oh my gosh. Add uh, fat folks into your porn and it totally changes your mind about like what fat bodies look like when they're having sex um, because they look really different from thin bodies. Have She's the type of person that would tell me to watch straight, you know what, to become straight. So they look, you know, fairly different. Um, and it's like, wow. And you can, you can actually objectively experience somebody else's body moving and doing all these hot things. And you're like, wow, I can do that. Look at that. Like my leg can go up that far too. Um, so that's one of my absolute favorites. Um, another one is hang out with some fat people, uh, make a fat friend. Maybe you don't have to like say, you know, you don't have to go up to your coworker and be like, Hey girl, you're fat. Let's hang out. Like, I mean, maybe she's not ready for that. Um, and that's okay, but, you know, think to yourself, like, am I consistently attracted to certain friends because... Do not ever try to be my friend just because I'm fat. That is creepy, weird. That's like people who are like, oh, I want to have a gay pet, or, oh, I want to, you know, I know there's a lot of people that are also like, oh, I need to try to be friends with somebody because they're a person of color. It's creepy and weird. Just be a human being. Stop it. This is showing she's a very bigoted person. The way that she views the world, she's categorizing people all the time. She must be a nightmare to be around. I think that they will help me look better or make me seem Ew. less visible. Um, and just like check in with yourself about your little internal the thing is is that a lot of these people they they will project a lot of this is a projection of how she is real that's another really good one and a great way to do that is to like keep a journal um one prompt i think is really interesting is if you write nonstop for 30 minutes um about how you think about your body or who you're attracted to or what kind of, you know, what do you, have you ever had a fat friend? Have you ever had a, a close friendship with a fat person? Um, you know, anything, you just write nonstop for 30 minutes and see what happens and like, don't lift your pen from the paper and, um, and then go back, like give yourself a day, um, read it and then kind of go through and, and see where, the the shitty ideas are coming out and then what i like to do is unravel the history right so you basically um you know you figure out where, what the idea is and then you kind of like work backwards it's like detective work girl um and you figure out where the idea came from did it come from your family did it come from school did it come from like that one person who broke your heart when you were seven um do you have any original thoughts of your own that would be a really interesting journal question because according to Virgie Tovar, nobody ever thinks for themselves, apparently. That's you, Virgie. You're the one that doesn't think for yourself. Not everybody else. You're crazy. Oh my gosh. Wow. Solipsistic. This is what I'm talking about. She cannot fathom that anybody has a different experience than her. She cannot. I think she's physically incapable of seeing that did it come from church where did it come from and then as you kind of can unravel it but again where did these crazy ideas that you're talking about come from virgie was it your university who told you this you're never supposed to think about where this came from 
only what you learned at church or from your parents or whatever else. These people are always about question everything else so you can agree with me. They never tell you to question what they're saying. Well, I'm questioning what you're saying, Virgie. I find that tracing the history of um, of a way of thinking really, really, really um, can unveil amazing things. About yes, I agree. That's why we're doing this. Oh, uh, where it comes from, and also it can help you start to deconstruct it and relinquish it, which is ultimately what we want to do. So all these exercises. I agree. We can agree on that, Virgie just some suggestions um i'll try to remember to post some maybe like I'll, i'm gonna try i'm gonna turn this episode into a blog um and then i'll try to come up with some more ideas about how to um relinquish or internalize that phobia but for now i am going to take off because i need to um i think get a tuna sandwich or something yeah okay well it was great talking to you and i hope to see you soon girl bye Oh. that was horrifying um i don't know with virgie it's weird because it's always worse than i think it will be every time um my assessment of virgie tovar i think that there is somewhat of a chance that there was some deep childhood trauma in this person i feel like she is just so desperate to please or lie or something like there's just something off and I think what a lot of younger people like a lot of you guys are Gen Z or you know maybe you were growing up or whatever and a lot of you guys don't understand that a lot of these people online were nuts like this was back in 2012 she's nuts she has a she's got some kind of mental thing going on. She's not living in reality. And so I worry about younger people that are listening to this stuff. And when you're young, you just kind of believe something, especially when you're like 15, 13, et cetera, right? If you're like really young watching Virgie Tovar, you know, back in 2013 or 2012, I worry that these sort of messages can kind of cloud things for younger people. And that's why I'm trying to do this too. It's like there's a lot of reasons why we have to fight this. I do care about the next generation. I care about my generation. I care about older people. Like I care about everybody. Um, I don't want a lot of us to lose parents much sooner than we should. I don't want my generation to be stunted by obesity any more than we already have been and I don't want that to continue at all so while again I can understand some of the concepts of challenging a culture that you were raised in I think it's really important that we actually improve upon it not make it worse which Virgie's arguing to make it worse um I want to live in a world where it's okay to be with somebody that you're attracted to as long as, you know, like I said, there's nothing heinous going on. There's consent. There's adults, right? You're adults. These kind of things. Um, as long as there's that mutual attraction and it's not bad in any of those ways, I want you to be able to, to date that person. I want you to be able to not have to be obese. I want the answers of obesity to be out there so that at least people can choose, so that it can be a complete choice. It is a choice. I believe it is, but it is a clouded choice right now. There's a lot of misinformation around the issue of obesity. And so I want a world where you can say, like, I don't want to be obese. And you can make that decision and you can just lose the weight and get out of it and stay out of it. That's why I argue for my protocol. It's the best thing I've ever done. I've tried everything. As I said in my profile, I'm on the boulevard of broken diets. You know, you can find me there. And um, 
anyways, so I understand wanting to challenge culture, challenge certain things, but I think it's really important to be aiming towards something, not aiming towards the ground, but aiming towards the sky. <laughs> Anyways, you guys, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this. Please let me know what you think about Retro FA as a series. And I will get back to you guys very soon. Have a good rest of your day, night, whatever. See you soon. Bye.